Good evening. I will now call the October 26, 2021 work session of the Ben Lapine School Board of Directors to order. I would like to introduce our participants this evening. To my immediate right, Marcus Legrand, Amy Tatum, Yannette Sarayirandi Gonzalez, Shamika Montgomery, and Shirley Olson. Joining remotely is Carrie McPherson Douglas. And to, the, to my immediate left, Superintendent Steve Cook, Deputy Superintendent Lauren Nordquist, and Board Clerk Janet Bojanowski. I am Melissa barnes Delafia, Chair of the Board. We are joined by Kayla Celadon and Hannah Westfall tonight for live ASL interpretation, and this meeting will be translated into Spanish as well. At this point, would you please stand, remove your hats, and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. In looking, we are now moving on to item three, review of the agenda. Um, are there any changes to the agenda? There are no changes to the agenda. Fellow board members, are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing no changes, we will proceed. A quick note for our stakeholders. Work sessions are designed as an opportunity for our board to engage with staff regarding their actions and initiatives that advance the board goals. Typically, no action is taken during these sessions, though during this pandemic, timelines have required this at some time. Uh, therefore, public comment is not taken during work sessions, but it is offered at every board meeting, regular board meeting, which is the first of the two each month and typically held on the second Tuesday. We will now move forward with our work session. As mentioned in our opening, board work sessions, the second meeting of each month, are focused on a deeper dive into the core work and initiatives that the district has undertaken to support progress toward the mission and vision of the district and of the board goals. As we look to the 2021-22 board calendar, we have developed what I would like to call an arc um, of reporting uh, for these sessions. During work sessions, we will be focusing on one or two of the board goals to, move, to more deeply understand the work taking place in these areas. This is work we do not govern in terms of its execution as a board, but should be informed on as they relate to advancing the board goals and ensuring they are in, in alignment with the executive limitations, which are set uh, for our superintendent. We will then bring forward the more technical <laughs> executive limitations that correspond to this work for approval at the following board, regular board meeting. And I know that this is complicated, um, but I just want to really support us and our board um, and our public in terms of understanding those two different pieces and why we have work sessions and why we have work regular meetings. And so for the benefit of our public viewing, as well as ourselves, I want to remind us of the current board goals, which are as follows. One, students develop a strong academic foundation. Two, students have a passion, purpose, and plan for their future. Three, students are engaged. Four, students, families, and staff experience inclusion and belonging. And five, staffing reflects the diversity of our students, families, staff, and community. Tonight, we will dive into board in one and two, developing a strong academic foundation and ensuring students have a passion, purpose, and plan for their future. We will do so by looking at the goals, being able to look at some data, and then really being able to hear about the actions that our district has taken um, over the previous year and what they're going to be taking on um, moving forward. And these will be in relation to two things we call executive limitations, um, and that will be executive limitation number eight on our instructional program and executive limitation number nine on technology. With that said, I also want to name that we will hear tonight actually work that's advancing multiple goals. Um, because education is interconnected. And as I worked through the reports with our team in preparation for this meeting, I found that they also very much 
reflect board goal number three on engagement, um, as well as goal number four on inclusion and belonging. And I literally, whoop, I, I, my visuals, but <laughs> literally went through and, and marked up the reports and said, number one, number two, number three, number four. Um, and so I just want to say that it's um, not, no action is exclusive to a single board goal, but I think we're going to hear some really great work tonight that our district is taking to support, especially goal number one and two, but actually many of the goals that we've set as a board. Um, so with that said, I want to hand this over. Um, oh, my notes <laughs> didn't save. Um, but I want to hand this over now to um, Dr. Laura Nordquist, our Deputy Superintendent, for um, a, a discussion on board and executive <laughs> limitation number eight and nine or eight, excuse me, with the support of um, Dave Van Lu, our Assistant Director of Assessment. Thanks, Melissa. Um, as Melissa said, the, the board goals and our executive limitations um, move across each other. So um, while this may not be a comprehensive look, at uh, our strong academic foundation work and our work around students' passion, purpose, and plan. It's certainly a way to start a conversation. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Van Lu. Um, as you know, during the pandemic, many of our traditional ways of collecting data about student achievement were lost for a year and a half. Uh, we did truncated state assessments last year, no state assessments the year before. Um, but as you know, one of our measures for early literacy is uh, the DIVLS screening assessment, which we do three times a year. Uh, and we were able, with the work of Julie Walker and her team, to create a DIVLS team again this fall. So we have DIVLS testing from the fall of 2019, DIVLS testing from the fall of 2021 with some pretty interesting information. Um, the other thing that Dave has to share has to do, we, we still taught classes and awarded grades uh, for our students and there's some also interesting data in terms of student grades over the last uh, couple of years. So Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you first. All right, good evening. <clears throat> um, let's see, who do I direct the slides? There's a clicker right there. Oh, awesome. Right. So yeah, there's really three pretty much key and uh, key uh, performance indicators that we're going to look at tonight that we pay attention to as a district. Uh, the first one that we're showing up here it has to do with early literacy. Um, Dibbles is it was formerly named Dibbles. It's actually called the Cadence now, the version that we use. But we've been using some version of that for probably. 20, 20 plus years in our district. It's a really, um, really powerful, really useful tool that we have. So there's a lot going on here. So I'll try to explain it as best I can. Um, first off, pay attention to, there's a box, a box and a whisker. There's four of these. So um, what the box shows is really the, the distribution of students in a grade level, how they're performing on a measure. So if you look at the solid line in the middle of that box, that would be a student at the 50th percentile, your typical most average uh, student. If you look at the bottom of the box, that's a student at the 20th percentile, and the top of the box is a student at the 80th percentile. So the box itself represents really kind of the average range or typical range of students, about the middle 60%. <clears throat> and then, you see the, the whisker sticking up the top and sticking down the bottom. Uh, that, the one on the top goes up to the 95th percentile, so one of the highest performing uh, in, on that measure. And then the, the bottom one goes down to the 5th percentile. So all in all, that encapsulates about 90% of students. So it's basically capturing the entire distribution of students. 
um, in a grade level. The colors on here, um, the green indicates that's a, sta a performance standard. Green means if a student is at that level, they are on benchmark, they're predicted to have uh, little difficulty becoming proficient readers in the future. If a student is down in the red range, that would be considered at risk. Uh, we would predict substantial difficulties in getting students to uh, reading benchmarks. And if a student is at that blue level, then they are actually performing above benchmark. <clears throat> and then finally on this, we're looking at two cohorts of students. So on the left, we're looking at the last cohort of kindergartners to second graders. So kindergarten is the far left. And then the, that cohort's second grade performance is on the right of that. So that's the last cohort of students we had that had full in-person instruction in K and all the way through first grade and second grade. If you look on the right of this, we're looking at um, another K-2 cohort, but this is the last cohort who in, I guess, fall of kindergarten, it was 1920, we all thought it was just the start of another normal school year, but what ended up happening was that school year was basically cut short in March. And then in first grade, all of those students experienced remote learning, or distance learning. So that's a group of students who um, got anything but education as we've normally seen it. And so the data up here for those students is their current fall of second grade data for this school year. Um, so these lines that I've added here show basically rates of progress or rates of growth for each of these cohorts. And really all I want you to notice here is how the slope of growth, how the slope of the line is different for this second cohort. For the kids who are currently in second grade, the learn rates of learning are flatter. And the lower your initial performance was, the flatter your rate of growth is. So you can see that the students who are at the 20th percentile were growing less quickly in reading skills than students who are at the 80th percentile. Technology malfunction. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so the red arrows here is what I want to call your attention to. So these are the students at the 20th percentile in second grade. And you can see in, back in 1920, those students were basically, the 20th percentile had actually moved just above that red zone into the yellow zone. If you look at the current group of second graders, you can see that the 20th percentile is actually well, well below the red zone. So what we're seeing here is really a, a double whammy. These kids are growing at a lower rate and they've lost significant ground compared to what the benchmark is that would predict reading success. Like, just as a comparison, if you looked at the 50th percentile, the middle of the box, uh, in second grade, those students were about at a score of around 200 on this measure, right at the, the blue line for exceeding the benchmark. And in the current year, they, they lost ground, but they were still well above green. They're still on track to be readers. Um, and what's the other thing that you might notice in this is um, that the students who are second graders in 1920, uh, as a whole, you're looking at fewer than 20% of those students in our district were actually in the at-risk range. If you look at our current second graders, you'd estimate there's probably 30 to 40% of our second graders are now in the at-risk range. So, I mean, it's conceivable that we've doubled the number of students who are at high risk for reading difficulties in the future. And then just one more uh, look at these data. Uh, these lines are now comparing the, basically the learning loss, for lack of a better term, from, second, from the two diff different cohorts of second graders. And again, just notice that the slope of the decrease in the line, again, is greater for the students who are um, lowest in the box at the 20th percentile. go. So the second piece of data I want to show you is <clears throat> uh, high school students receiving at least one F or n um, basically no credit bearing grade. I'm going to refer to these as students receiving Fs, but technically 
Uh, it doesn't mean, not every student here actually received an F. What it means is they took a course and they received no credit for completing that course. So it may have been an F, it may have been just credit was not awarded, but for all intents and purposes, if you take a course in high school and you get no credit for it, um, yeah, you have very little to show for it when you're done with it. So uh, there's three lines on here. Uh, the gray line in the middle is uh, the percentage of high school students for our district who received at least one F in a course. And we're looking at probably eight years worth of data there. Um, and we've, uh, so we've got a system called DART that we track a lot of our data in. So we've built these displays and we built the, these intentionally to show gaps. A lot of times when we talk about gaps, we'll take a group and compare it to the whole. So we might take that dark red and compare it to the gray line. But really, if you wanna see the true magnitude of a gap, you have to look at students who have some characteristic and students who do not have some characteristics. So what we've built into here is, uh, this is a, a, an aggregation of all the students we would consider from a historically underserved group. So that could be students in special education, students from underserved racial or ethnic groups, um, students from ec economically disadvantaged group, and English language learners are the, the four major ones here. <clears throat> so the dark red line are this, those, all of those students who belong to at least one of those historically underserved groups. The light red line are the students who do not fall into any one of those groups. So those students meet none of the characteristics for being from a historically underserved group. And two things I guess I would call your attention to. One is the size of the gap between those two groups is pretty consistent. Um, you don't see a lot of change over time. And the other thing is there was a large, pretty significant drop in kids actually receiving an F in the 1920 school year. A lot of that has to do with directives from the Oregon Department of Education where they basically put a moratorium on giving Fs. So that, that explains a lot of that drop. Um, and then through the rest of these is just examples of the different groups that we talked about. So, and these, I've ordered these basically in order of the size of the group for our district. So the largest historically underserved group for us are um, students who receive, are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So you'll notice that anytime we look at this group, it's pretty common that it looks like the overall historical underserved because they make up such a large part of that group. So, but you see a similar story here. Uh, this, these are um, students who are historically served from traditional, from um, different racial and ethnic groups. Um, this, so the graph looks a little bit different, but you see the gaps are still there. Uh, here is special ed. And then here are English language learners. And this is ever ELL, so it's currently served ELL and the student, students who were ELL in the past. Um, and one of the things that you notice here is there's a spike in the last year. Um, it looks like the, the pandemic and what's been going on probably had a pretty significant impact on this group. And also uh, you see a spike like this that's not quite as large with students um, from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. And then finally, so the third measure is, this is called ninth grade on track. The idea here is it's ninth graders who earn at least a quarter of the credits that they need to graduate from high school during their freshman year. So by the time they're starting their 10th grade year, we want them to have earned six credits in any courses. Um, one big thing I think I'd call your attention to is again, the gap is pretty consistent over time. You don't see a whole lot of change when you aggregate all of our historically underserved students together. The second is there is a big decrease in ninth graders actually earning six credits for us. It was about a 11, 12% drop. That mirrors exactly what the state reported. Uh, I think the state was around 12% as well and it mirrors um, a lot of what you've seen probably in the news nationally as well. So um, this certainly is not unique to us, but it's uh, definitely concerning. Basically what this means is there's a lot more students this year starting 10th grade who are off track for graduating. And the research behind this measure is really powerful. <coughs> um, 
I would say this is an early warning indicator to high school and high school graduation that's as powerful as the early literacy is to elementary. I and mean, we know that if students are off track at the end of their ninth grade year, uh, it's substantially more difficult for them to earn a high school diploma within four years. <clears throat> and then just here are the other groups again, so free and reduced, and you can see this looks a lot like the overall population. Um, historically underserved racial and ethnic groups. Um, and you'll, what you'll notice here is about four years ago, the gap really started to close here. Um, and then we have special ed. And we have our English language learners, which again looks a lot like the historically underserved uh, racial and ethnic groups, where the gap was closing initially, and it's been pr the gap has been pretty much closed for the last four years on this measure, but everyone has seen that big drop in <clears throat> being on track at the end of ninth grade. So there, I will pause and see what questions people have or comments. Great, I'll open it up to our board for questions or comments. And I think I, one of the things we're trying to work on is really making sure that when we're asking a question, we're saying <laughs> it's a question, um, whereas maybe we have a wondering or a, that is more of a, just a comment. Dave, I have a question. Um, would you say that from that data that the pandemic had great influence on early grade achievement, the K-12 levels, um, for all students or just for some students? So I would say it, these data and other data that we've looked at, and again, if you follow the stories that you hear nationally, the, the, everyone's been impacted, but the impact has been disproportionate to students who have historically been least well served uh, by schools. And that's certainly not unique to us. That's here, that's all throughout Oregon, and that's all throughout the US from pretty much any data we've been able to find. I think along those same lines, this feels really loud. <laughs> um, but along those same lines, a question When I'm looking at those data slides, am I correct in understanding that we've made significant progress since 2013-14 in terms of closing that gap? Um, but for some of our, our groups then, this pandemic really has been the driving factor for widening that gap again. Yeah, and again, that's somewhat measure dependent. I mean, we certainly, when you look at just students receiving Fs, we haven't really, the gap hasn't changed at all. Mm -hmm. It's been pretty consistent over mm -hmm. time. If you look at ninth grade on track, uh, for historically underserved racial and ethnic groups and for ELL students, it, it changed a lot. It shrunk a lot four years ago, but for other groups, uh, the change, the, the gap shrinkage was much smaller mm -hmm. if it was even there. So it, it's, once you get into the, the weeds of the data, there's sure. all sorts of, different trends there. Okay, and I think that Carrie has a question. Hi, thank you. Um, I've said this before, but I first want to just appreciate um, David and the team showing us the data, even when it's hard. Um, in many ways, our board and public relies on you to choose what data you show us, and you probably could have chosen to show us um, more hopeful data. So. Uh, just really appreciate, again, having an honest conversation about um, about where we need to focus because we can't fix it if we don't acknowledge it. Um, I really appreciate the visualizations you chose. Um, they were pretty clear. And so I don't have a lot of questions about the data you presented. Obviously, I think my question, and I assume you're getting here, is what are we going to do about it? Um, and just you know, reminding us all that although these are dots and lines on the screen that um, each one of them represent a potential life opportunity lost um, because of this pandemic. And I know the weight of that uh, weighs on all of us. So 
hopeful that we're going to talk about what the district is planning to try to do. Um, but again, thank you for a, a really thorough and um, helpful display of the data. Yeah, so I know Julie will address some of the early literacy. I can just comment briefly on some of the things we're doing around grading and credits. I know um, <clears throat> right now, like last year, you probably recall that we put a moratorium on giving kids zeros on a 100 point scale. Um, so I, we think that had a positive impact for students. Uh, right now, we also have a group in our district um, of administrators and teachers working together on looking at the research on equitable grading practices and the goal of that group is to come forth with a recommendation to the district in terms of what are the things that we can recommend and put forth to the district to consider that will make our grading scale, grading systems more equitable for all of the students that we serve. Um, at our high schools, uh, I'm not sure how many of you, if you know this, but we have these positions called graduation coaches where the, 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 historically, the focus has really been on those ninth graders and getting them successful in their first year of high school. Uh, obviously, from this data, you can extrapolate the challenge that now there's twice as many uh, ninth graders who are going into 10th grade who are short credits, and you have all those students coming into ninth grade who uh, had the difficulties of remote learning last year in eighth grade. So their workload has gone up considerably. Um, but they're doing great things for students. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cook? Um, I, Dave, can we go back to the box and whiskers? There's a, a, not so much a question as a point of emphasis that I want to draw attention to. Um, the one that has the differences in the slopes, if we may. Thank you. This that, one? That's the one. And so what I'd like to draw attention to on this is there's a narrative that learning loss is, uh, is just learning loss and that it is evenly distributed amongst all of our students and it is an impact of the, the pandemic and that the pandemic has therefore caused learning loss and therefore all should be uh, attentive to that. And I, I think to some extent I, that's, that's true, but to some extent it is absolutely not true. And I wanna just draw attention to if you look at, in the box and whiskers, if you look at the, the first cohort compared to the second cohort, you see that groups of kindergartners came in almost identical in their, in their placement. If you look at the 95th percentile of those students at second grade, and you look at the 95th percentile of the second cohort in second grade, you will notice that those students are in almost the exact same scoring. And, and the reason that, that I wanted to draw attention to that is that nationally this is playing out that many of our students across the country that have systems at home and, are, and have supports at home are actually coming out just fine while the growth of the students with the least opportunity for those resources being accessible at home is being exacerbated by the pandemic. And therefore, we shouldn't fall into a fallacy of that this is equally distributed and being carried by all students. And I wanna make sure that that statement is uh, clear and how we're talking about this necessity that we have got to reach those students that don't have near as much access and be able to focus much of our attention on that um, because those are the students that are most at risk. And if you translate this forward seven more years, you can anticipate that those students that might enter into their freshman year is more likely to be behind in their graduation expectations. And so I just wanna make sure that we call that out explicitly. Now there is, I mean, do notice the slope is different for the masses as well. So this, there is some impact across all students as it's felt, but uh, it isn't an evenly distributed impact. Thank you. Are there other questions for Dave? Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. As we're getting ready uh, to transition to Julie talking about foundational literacy skills, I, I just wanna add a couple things. And one, I know not all of you were part of the board during this time, but one of the things that happened in Bendel Pine Schools is that this board fought very hard to get kids safely back into school. And I knew it, I knew it and believed that our kids were being harmed. But seeing this data is so compelling to me as a, 
as a reminder that we knew that our kids who didn't have all the supports at home were really struggling uh, during this pandemic. And so I just wanna thank our board of directors past and present um, for your efforts because um, it could have been worse. Our students, our K-2 students were going to school every day starting in the end of January. I wonder what the data looks like in a district where they started going in late April a couple of days a week. Um, so anyway, it's, it's just chilling data to me. I did, Julie's going to focus on early literacy, but I, one of the things that I'd like to also add about our work at the middle and high schools, because the middle school data in terms of grades does not look more promising than the high school. They've shared the high school data, but um, it's also um, concerning, very concerning at the middle school level. And uh, Dave mentioned the graduation coaches, uh, and, and um, we continue to work hard on really having strong multi-tiered systems in, of support at the middle school and high school level. And uh, this morning we were working with all the high school principals and assistant principals on their design plans and I heard so much focus on really having strong systems to support all students. And one of the things that um, we've been emphasizing in our elementary schools for a long time, but maybe not as strongly at the middle school and high school level, is it is the work of classroom teachers to develop tier, to deliver tier one and even many tier two interventions, whether those are academic interventions, whether they're social and emotional supports. And um, sometimes there's been a mentality of, like there's somewhere else a child should go. You know, I always call it room 12. You know, that that's where somehow all those struggles are going to be fixed. And I was so, um, it was so powerful to hear the principals talking today as they were working on their plans, that recognition of just making sure that every teacher understands it's my responsibility, it's my responsibility. Um, and we have to work together to find those supports uh, for students. It's not, there's, there's not enough places to send kids and there's not enough staff, even if we hired four or five times more interventionists. We all have to share that work of, of helping every student be successful. So that was one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, and with that, and Julie, I was hoping, I know you have your slides about um, the foundational literacy work that's coming, but I think it's also important for the board to hear what's some of the work right now as we're uh, working with triage with our students. Hi, um, I'm Julie Walker. I'm the elementary director of curriculum and instruction and systems. And um, I wanna talk to you a little bit about what we're doing right now to address our K-2 literacy especially. And then I wanna talk to you a little bit about our timeline for the language arts materials adoption that um, is starting this year. So um, if you're looking up at our chart up here, um, we're looking at what's called Scarborough's Rope. And um, this is really um, a, a diagram that helps us understand how kids learn how to read. Um, and, the, and the big thing to understand is that um, it's word recognition plus language comprehension equals reading comprehension. And so we really need to look at like, how are we building word recognition in students, otherwise known as foundational skills, and then how are we building that language comprehension in students? Um, and so when we think about accelerating student learning, um, we're really thinking about in the early years, we're thinking about accelerating foundational skills knowledge and accelerating knowledge and vocabulary for students. Um, and this is really what we're helping teachers to do right now is to really think about when you're learning foundational skills as being, um, a separate thing from when you're learning knowledge and vocabulary. Because in order for kids to learn foundational skills, we have to be really focused on what's important. Um, and what's important around that are these concepts. Um, so phonological awareness, phonics and word recognition, fluency and print concepts are the big ideas around early literacy accelerators. 
Um, there's a lot of uh, brain research that's come out in the last few years that talks about the importance of direct explicit instruction around phonics and word recognition, which I think that we have done a pretty good job with in the past. What, what we missed in the research and what has happened in the last couple of years in the research is the importance of phonological awareness. Our current materials that we adopted in the last round did not address phonological awareness to the degree that research is saying that we needed to. So in the last couple of years, we have been working very hard to get as many teachers as we can trained in Orton-Gillingham, which is an explicit phonics um, instructional approach. Um, this summer, we trained 30 people with Orton-Gillingham. And the exciting thing is that we trained 15 teachers. Um, and since the August training, it has been so encouraging to watch these 15 teachers go back to their schools and say, wow, this is incredible. We all need to be doing this work and just watching what has happened since then. So that's been really, really exciting. So we have the Orton-Gillingham training happening, but we also have, um, we committed this year to an initiative to train all of our K-1 teachers around Scarborough's Rope and the Science of Reading. Um, and so originally we had planned three half days with every K-1 teacher with a coaching cycle with our instructional coaches after that. With the shortest of subs, we um, have, have moved that to some of our um, what's called educator network days. So um, we are doing that work still with our K-1 teachers. We refuse to give up on that. Um, and then our instructional coaches are following up with the teachers. Um, and so we launched that work um, October 13th, I believe it was, 12th or 13th. Um, and now we're off and running with the coaching cycles happening and the teachers are very excited about this work. Um, so the sense of urgency, I mean like the, the data that we looked at is, is our sense of urgency, but we really had a sense of urgency before that on really needing a solid foundational skills scope and sequence. Um, what happens in our, like I call them big box reading programs, like when you adopt a program that sort of has everything, what happens within that is that it's really hard to focus on what's important. And so what we, our sense of urgency is to have a really strong foundational skills scope and sequence. So teachers can focus on the most important things. Um, and to address that phonological awareness piece um, that, that we need to do. The what? Oh, okay, the phonological awareness piece we really, really need to address. Oh, what it is. <laughs> sorry, I'm like, what? What's the difference between phonological awareness and phonics? Okay, sorry. Um, so phonological awareness is the umbrella for like the sounds in words. It's like the auditory piece of being able to, um, at the biggest umbrella level is uh, rhyming, um, like being able to count the number of words in a sentence, being able to hear syllables. Um, but what we have found that's even more important than that is the ability to break down a word like stop into stop, or if I say stop, for you to be able to say stop. And then the even higher level of that is to be able to substitute, delete, and move around sounds in words. Um, so, so that's the piece um, that we're really working hard to address. Um, and we, it, we really need to do that with materials. So we need to shore up some of our materials. And we also need to shore up our instructional practices. Um, because what we know is that you know, materials are really helpful in maintaining a scope and sequence, but it's our teachers that are the most powerful tool for us. Um, and so with that being said, one of the most important things is that ongoing job embedded professional learning for our teachers. Um, let's see here, I wanna show you just one of the things that we've in invested in instructional coaches and the reason behind that is because of this Joyce and Showers research study that really said that you know typical PD that we have done in the past that's the sit and get um, like go to a you know go to a session and you listen and then you go back like really about zero percent of that actually gets put into practice 
Um, and even with you know, the presenter modeling things and the participants practicing in that moment, that really amounts to about 5% of really actually happening in the classroom. And so we are really aiming for getting 95% of what we are working on happening in the classrooms. Um, because in order to get to student success, we need to be at at least 90% implementation. And so we are really relying on our instructional coaches to give that ongoing coaching and support with feedback to help our teachers to learn those really important instructional practices um, and to accelerate the learning of our earliest readers. Um, so with that being said, one of the things, so we are starting, oops, how do I go backwards? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, I did it again. The next one's down, there you go. Okay, wrong button. Okay, there you go. so with that being said, um, one of the things that we um, have decided to do moving forward on our language arts adoption is to accelerate the adoption. Um, we had originally planned on implementing our language arts adoption not this school year, but next school year. Um, and with um, the, uh, the need to really address early literacy right now, we have decided to go with a foundational skills uh, materials adoption this school year. So what you're seeing here is an outline of our timeline. Um, so we're starting um, right now on um, getting our committee together and uh, we are starting listening sessions with students, staff, parents, and community members. Um, what we're, we really wanna gather all of our stakeholders, thoughts and um, stories to help guide our work. Um, and so by the end of December, we're hoping to publish our findings um, and our action steps moving forward. Um, and then in January, we'll um, establish our core beliefs. Um, and then from there, we will be reviewing the materials and testing those materials in the classroom. Um, we're hoping to be able to share some of those materials with um, caregivers and families at um, April conferences. And then by May, we're hoping to have some consensus and a decision um, and present to our board. And after that, order the materials and, st and start our professional learning plan to implement next fall. Um, and then, so that's our foundational skills adoption. Okay, now I'm going the wrong way. Is it this one that goes forward? Okay, sorry, I'm technologically struggling. Um, okay, so then the following school year, um, so 22-23 will be foundational skills implementa implementation. And during that school year is when we will be looking at language arts. Um, and so what we're thinking about in terms of accelerators for grades two through five, um, on the left, these are our accelerators. So we're really looking at making sure that all of our kids are learning how to read. That foundational skills piece is key. And we are, having, we are addressing that in second through fifth as well because we have kids that did not get their foundational skills. Um, but with that, we're also really focused on growing knowledge of the world, um, expanding the vocabulary that children bring with them, really um, thinking about how um, we gather text evidence and, and communicate out what we have learned from that deepening the understanding of what is read, and then um, really supporting universal access for all kids. And then um, on the instructional side of things, we are working on the five practices that you see up here. Um, and these are practices that we're working on K-12, um, but we will also be working on them as we go through this language arts adoption. Um, and so again, you see the, um, this is our timeline. So we, after the foundational skills adoption, we'll move into the language arts adoption and that will go through the following school year. And then we will begin implementation fully um, in the 23-24 school year. Mm -hmm. Not the K-12, but the rest of the That's the rest, that will be K-12 as well, so. Um, so with that being said, are there any questions that you have for me? Uh, I want to share an appreciation. Um, I love that we're doing this work. Uh, we had previously 
you know, two years ago, heard a lot from families very concerned about reading and how we were failing students with dyslexia mm -hmm. um, and not identifying them and giving them the interventions they needed. So this work is so important for that. Um, you had mentioned we trained 15 teachers in Orton-Gillingham. How are we spreading that knowledge or targeting that knowledge to students who we know need the highest level of intervention or potentially are dyslexic and need identification? Right. So over the last four years, we've trained over 100 staff members um, in the Orton-Gillingham method or the Orton-Gillingham approach. A lot of those were specialists, and so they were providing um, interventions to students that needed it the most. Our goal now is to, to spread that to classroom teachers because we believe that we really need that knowledge in the core curriculum that's happening for students. So our plan moving forward is to continue not only with our foundational skills trainings for all teachers, um, which encompass a lot of the Orton-Gillingham approach, but to continue to offer that specialized training as well. Did that answer? Okay. Thank you, Julie, appreciate it very much. Uh, my question is this, well, comment first and I'll ask a quick question. Um, I think the hardest thing to look at this reading is, uh, the hardest thing to measure with this is environment. I think that's the most critical piece with a lot of this is environment and also parental advisory in terms of helping the parents understand where they can help their with, the, uh, with their students. My question is how are we are ad uh, adjusting or trying to work to make sure we can have the parents as well as the student be a little bit more engaged or peer to peer uh, opportunities to be able to help these students be able to get to a closer, to closing the gap. What are we doing? I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I said that all messed up. So how are we working with families? Did I understand that correctly? Um, our, I mean, I, I think our hope is with this language arts adoption is to really have a lot of community touch points where we are sharing what we were working on with families, caregivers, um, and, and sharing the what of what we were doing and bringing the families more into that process. Um, and then moving forward, I mean, my, my hope is that we continue to build those relationships with families that we have like started over the last year or two um, and continue to use the resources that we have at our, our hands that we didn't necessarily have before, like WebEx and um, Seesaw and Google Classroom um, as tools to really help involve families even more than we have in the past. And if, if I may just add a couple of points to this, I think first of all, it's important for us to to recognize that we're starting to slide into the third board goal here, which is how do we engage with our families and par build partnerships with them. The, the families that are doing the best job of supporting their student learning at home are the ones that are seeing the greatest amount of success. And so there's a lot more for us to follow up on when we start talking about that board goal and how we are trying to get into those relationships with each and every family. And I think secondly, I just, neither Laura or Julie are going to do this. So I wanna take just a minute to talk about how reading wars are happening across the country and how important it is that we have recognized in this district the importance of a balanced approach, not just with balanced literacy, but the idea of the, the science of reading and mixing that as our approach so that we're ensuring that students are getting a comprehensive approach to early literacy. And I, and I can't, I, I, I was pushing pretty hard uh, when I first got here to, to unpack that, and both Laura and Julie um, did a very good job of reassuring that, that we are where we need to be with that and meeting those expectations. So I wanna give both of them a shout out, and I also wanna um, publicly call out Lindsley Gehrig for the work that she's doing helping our teachers in the training. And so this is exactly where we need to be and making sure that we do this next step with these uh, adoptions with fidelity and ensure that our families are getting access to this is going to be critical for bringing our students out of this pandemic with as little impact as we can. Thank you. Thank you. I think I might have a question from Carrie. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will echo the thanks. Um, my question is about that third grade reading um, uh, sort of bar where we know that if students can't read well by third grade, um, what their likely long term outcomes are going to be. Um, and so I just I struggle um, to understand basically why we move kids forward when they can't read at third grade knowing 
um, what their likely outcomes are going to be. And I've seen some systems um, that have started to say, like, we're going to, you know, we're going to set a goal of 100% reading and proficiency by um, grade three and kind of full stop. Um, and so I'm just curious what your response is to that. I know that social emotionally kids need to move up with their grade level, um, but it just feels like we need to be doing more at that critical juncture um, to not sort of let that, uh, those likely outcomes play out. Carrie, that's, I'm gonna step in here. That's a, that's a great question. And I, I think the full stop I hope you've heard some things uh, tonight that would help in reflect that we are going at this full stop uh, to have 100% literacy by third grade. I, I wanna talk a little bit about that data. One of the reasons that third grade has been such a powerful benchmark is that traditionally people stopped teaching foundational skills at third grade. So it became uh, reading to learn, not learning to read. Um, I hope you hear in what Julie's saying that when we're talking about foundational reading skills, we're talking K-5 because we know that, and even at students who are at that benchmark at, at third grade, as the skills become more advanced, we continue to lose students. So, um, you know, we want to be thinking about a graduation benchmark, not a third grade benchmark, but I, I think it's important to recognize that as a predictor, Part of the reason for that is because of how schools have approached reading beyond grade three. Um, the second thing I wanna say is uh, while every case is individual, uh, the research on retention is um, very compelling. That in most cases, students are far more harmed by retention than, uh, than they gain by retention. Um, and so uh, we, we would never look at that. And, and again, that's in tune with all research. What we need to keep doing is keep intervening, keep having strong core instruction and foundational skills and continue to intervene. Um, and hopefully that end, not hopefully, that the plan, the goal is that that end becomes smaller and smaller. Um, as we move forward. And if I may just add one point to that, I think Laura hit that on the head. The, the second thing that I would add is just simply the fact that there's a massive amount of data on uh, as students that are learning to read at third grade now for many years have been the first subjects of state assessments. And so I would challenge that there's a little bit of uh, be careful with causation and correlation with that data. It's a great place for them to, for researchers to just tag on and say, we wanna focus on that because there's a, an opportunity to follow this population for the next eight years and nine years and see how they progress through the system. Um, reading skills are prerequisite for student success at all levels. Um, it doesn't start at third grade. It goes, it goes all the way through middle school and high school. And as a former middle school principal, I can tell you we had foundational reading skills in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade for some of our struggling learners. And I think that's part of what we would posit as a plan for helping students be successful when we wanna start looking at their ninth grade um, credit recovery and their credit systems. It, it, it is foundational that they have great reading skills. Thank you, super helpful. Um, and, and also just wondering, I'm sort of perpetually frustrated that it feels like we have to retrain teachers um, that come out of teacher prep programs once they get into our district. Um, so I'm just curious if you're seeing, especially locally, um, that, that you know, teachers are being prepared uh, correctly and if we can actually intentionally recruit from programs that we know um, are teaching uh, not only the science of reading at the younger grades, but are continuing to teach older grade teachers how to teach reading, since that sounds like um, it's a big answer. Yes, so um, over the last probably two to three years, we've been working really closely with OSU Cascades um, in regards to how they're preparing our teachers to teach reading and mathematics. Um, and so we have a partnership with them now where um, actually our instructional coaches are the teachers 
um, in that program. So they're teaching the classes. Um, and then we have all of the students that are in those classes um, coming into our classrooms to practice. So as part of their class, they have about 20 hours of time that they spend in the classrooms with um, our coaches helping them to learn the skills that they need to be successful in the classroom. So I'm excited about that alignment that we have coming up. Julie, I just have one other comment, and it's um, to support the fact that we're looking at regular classroom teachers to be able to deliver a tier one and tier two support to the kids. Typically, you know, you train the specialists. You know, the specialists are the ones who get trained and they have all the answers, supposedly. But um, two things. One is that we train them together. We train special ed teachers and DI teachers and EL teachers along with the special, you know, the, the regular classroom teachers. And secondly, uh, the coaching model uh, productively is extremely important and I'm sure that I just don't know how we structure our PLCs, you know, but I'm assuming that we do some with grade levels and some um, with different kind of configurations within different schools. But I just want to compliment the district um, for two things. One is with the extra funding that's come in over the last couple of years, the additional staff have been totally supportive or support uh, mechanisms for regular teachers. And that is exactly where it needs to be. So uh, I, you're more than on the right track and um, I'm very impressed. Thank you. Can I ask you to perhaps just provide a quick connection piece because I, I love um, being able to look at an overall model um, and then we're looking at this gap and would you be willing to talk a little bit about how the different pieces of language comprehension um, how that how the pandemic has impacted I, I know that we see the difference right we see the difference between some of our families and some of our students um, and how the slope has, has drastically hit them. But I'm not sure that we've, we've named um, enough linguistic um, isolation um, or other impacts in terms of the background knowledge, vocabulary knowledge. Mm -hmm. So just really that, that foundational piece of oral language and oral vocabulary development. And I'd love to hear you speak a little bit to that. Right, so um, the other, you're thinking of the other accelerator, um, that idea of building content knowledge. So that's our, that's our, other, um, our other piece that we're working really hard on is the idea of building content knowledge. So we're, we're really moving away from, in our reading instruction, that idea of isolated skills. For example, like um, teaching main idea and details one week and the next week teaching cause and effect, which has been our, our history, um, and we're moving more to a model that is, um, that is content focused, like spending multiple weeks building on a, a topic. Um, and so what that might look like um, is in a K-2 classroom is uh, read alouds that are very rich in, con in a content or a topic area, and the teachers are diving into that read aloud with the students, having conversations, students are talking to each other, um, and they're uh, talking in groups about that knowledge. And then also within the classroom, we're, talking, we're um, building like text sets that kids can engage in around those topics. Um, and book baskets that have those topic books in there that students can access at all different levels to build that knowledge and to have conversations with each other. Thank you, that's helpful. I have a question, a comment first, then question. I'm wondering if there is a plan that perhaps we're, I'm not seeing that sort of speaks to the adaptation that's necessary. We just finished seeing some of those slides that showed those big disparities, you know, particularly, you know, I'm thinking in, in the forefront of my mind, English language learners. Um, to this day, at my 41 years of age, 
if you ask me to go through some of the, you know, phonological awareness and, and, and testing, it, it doesn't register for those of us that are English language learners whose first language is either Spanish or, you know, some other language. And so I'm thinking about those scores, the, those gaps, and, and this plan to sort of get everybody sort of back on track. But where are we adapting those plans? And, and also, I think a, a big part of it plays into the demographics of the current teachers within our district. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for myself, growing up in Los Angeles, I had the opportunity to be taught by educators that looked like me and spoke like me. And so there were tricks and, and there were you know, ways that I could adapt to learn um, essentially how to speak the language according to how it should be spoken and read. And so I'm, I'm wondering if there is a plan or something that, that we're doing to sort of adapt those models to, to specifically address the English language learning gap. Okay. Can I let Laura speak to well, that? Well, and, and Kinsey might be able to speak to that as well, Janet, but um, one of the things that we're doing is growing our dual immersion program so that for our students who speak Spanish, for example, as their first language, which is, as we know, by far our largest second language group, um, that they're learning to read, they're learning everything in Spanish, their first language. Uh, and, and so they're, I'm, I'm looking, Kinsey's here, uh, and she could speak more, but, th but that approach is actually tailored uh, for, you know, a whole different notion. I mean, phonological awareness uh, in phonics in Spanish is far easier than English, for sure. Uh, and then we're finding, Kinsey, maybe you could speak to that just a little. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we're working on with our dual language team is um, our own PD on how literacy develops um, authentically in Spanish. So we're not just mapping English literacy development onto Spanish. Um, we know that phonological awareness doesn't have the same, that direct instruction of it doesn't work in Spanish. Um, so we have some differentiated professional development for our uh, bilingual educators to make sure that what uh, research shows from native Spanish speaking countries is the approach that we're taking with our community and with our students. Um, and so that's our largest portion of ELL students at the elementary stage are in our elementary stage of our dual language program. So that's a huge um, piece. And then the other piece is once they start to learn to read in English, we know you, you only learn to read once. Um, so then teaching them English is a very different approach. We don't just take our, um, you know, our kinder first grade strategies and apply them when the kids are in second grade learning to read. We are teaching them um, how to read sort of a, um, you know how to read in Spanish, now we're going to um, take the pieces that don't transfer. We're gonna explicitly teach some transfer skills and then we're gonna take the pieces that don't transfer and teach those explicitly. So um, a lot of differentiated PD with our, our dual language team. Um, and a lot of those skills actually apply to our ELL students not in the dual language program too as far as teaching transfer and teaching students to recognize you already know how to identify this word um, and how to, um, you know, understand that their native language skills, whether or not they're explicitly being taught that literacy in our schools, is valuable for them in learning English. Um, so those are just a couple of the pieces there. All right. Uh, before we move on, I do want to have one last shout out to OSU Cascades. Um, we're so fortunate that two of the leading professors at OSU Cascades in their education program are Rachel Sheets and Melinda Knapp, who are two outstanding former Ben Lapine Schools teachers. So we, we have a, a direct line to, to the expertise that OSU Cascades um, and another thing that I want to just compliment them on is the development of an undergraduate elementary education program. Because part of the problem, even with really well done literacy instruction, in an MAT program, you have to do all your coursework in about a year. And it's very difficult to go into depth in literacy instruction and in mathematics instruction in that amount of time. So the, and, um, I was talking to Melinda Knapp recently, and this may be wrong, so I'm sorry, Melinda, if I get it wrong, but instead of one math methods class, it's three math methods classes. 
Um, and so the opportunity for students to really get that pedagogy um, and, and be much better prepared as elementary teachers, um, I'm just very excited about that. And for our students, of course, it's a year less of college loans and financing education, and so uh, it's a real benefit for students in the program as well. In terms of EL8, you know, I was talking to Melissa and Steve uh, in, in looking at the agenda. This, this is a huge EL, and I think that we will come back to different highlights and present uh, at different points during our workshops this year, but I wanted to take just a minute and ask if there were particular areas that you had questions about whether from highlights that we addressed or from the compliance report, uh, and, and try to get to those now, uh, at least. I think the one piece that we haven't highlighted, and really it's the passion, purpose, and plan, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, the work that we're doing in terms of school to career. Oh, oh, and I'm so sorry that Katie's not here tonight. That she had a family emergency, so she was not able to be here, and she would be able to speak to that much better than I can, Melissa. We I are do, cycling these, so we can always <laughs> yeah. cycle back. I do to want that. to just point out just a couple of things, and and there's some very exciting work. So, because I'm not saying something doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just I don't feel as qualified to address it, but perhaps our most exciting move in our college and career readiness piece is that uh, Stephen Duvall, who's one of the most talented principals in Ben Lapine schools, has just accepted the position as the director of college and career readiness. So we have a leadership position focused on this area where we, we need to just continue to get better. Um, and so we're, we're very excited. He's transitioning out of Cascade as Gabe Pagano, the talented assistant principal for Ben Senior High, is stepping as the interim principal at Cascade. Uh, and so uh, he was at a meeting with us today, as a matter of fact. Very exciting. Um, not, not for tonight, but as you think about uh, talking in future in future about EL8. Um, I would love to hear more about um, how we are moving from islands of excellence mm -hmm. to um, ensuring that what is working reaches as many kids as possible. So just being you know honest about the fact that some teachers are better at teaching some things and are we looking at the data to figure out who those teachers yeah. are and then really systematically, making sure that they are able to share what they're doing um, across all of our schools. And again, just moving from islands of excellence to consistent excellence. I think that's great, Carrie. And I, I think we could talk at length about that. There are some great things happening, but one thing that was already referenced earlier this evening that is a huge component of that is the amount of SIA spending that we have devoted to instructional coaching. So whether we're talking about special programs, whether we're talking about ELL, whether we're talking about content area coaches at the secondary level, additional instructional coaches at the elementary level. So uh, for the first time um, in I don't know how long, uh, Julie referenced the Educator Network Day, the School Improvement Wednesday time uh, in mid-October. We had... Uh, secondary professional learning groups across content areas meeting all over the district and the in, having increased coaching or even people with part-time stipends in some of the content areas that can help facilitate and lead that work of their content area um, so, so that really promoting the sharing of best practices, the deep discussions, um, and there's some great work going on uh, in that area that we, we'd love to share more about at another, another workshop. Thanks. Um, I do want to also, uh, this is a comment, <laughs> an appreciation, um, but I do want to call out that within your priorities um, under Executive Limitation 8, um, there's a clear tie to what Julie was talking about before about how it's not just about PD, it's about coaching. 
And so I just really want to appreciate the fact that there is narrative here about how we are actually investing in coaching um, to make sh to to advance your objectives. And so I think that's um, commendable. Thank you. Are there any other questions on EL8 for Laura? Laura, the only thing I want to ask is that have you, with the cohorts, are you guys starting to talk about the implementation of the new social studies as well? The 2021 standards, yeah, Marcus, yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, social studies was an area that um, I, I would say, frankly, we haven't paid enough attention to as a, as a district. Certainly, we have outstanding teachers across the district. Um, we wanted to post, and we actually have in our funding, a full-time instructional coach uh, for social studies that we will post for next year. Uh, this year, um, the very talented Elizabeth Justima, who is a high school teacher at Summit High School, is doing an extended contract to lead the work. And then we have one of our elementary coaches as well, uh, we asked each of our elementary coaches to have a content area. So um, they are definitely engaged in that work. Um, we'll definitely see um, progress this year. Uh, it's not until 2026 that the st standards are required. We'd like to move faster. We think those are much stronger standards than the 2018 standards. But we, we really need that teacher leadership and time to, to do it right um, and, and make sure it's done right. So we're very excited about that. Shamiko? So just to clarify, um, even though that the standards are being implemented now or allowed to be implemented now, it's not until 2026. Are there classrooms that are, is it up to teacher discretion? Is that what you're saying? I, I would say it's not as much teacher discretion. I would say it's teacher awareness and understanding. I'm not sure, for example, at, at our elementary levels, we have not provided people with a professional development to even know, you know, where have we moved from the 2018 standards to the 2021 standards. Uh, we don't have any intention, Shamiko, of waiting till 2026, but they, they need professional development they need a line curriculum, they need the resources to teach it, so that, that is what we're working on. Okay, great. And, and that's not to say nothing's happening from the 2021 standards, certainly we have teachers who are very aware and very active, particularly at the secondary level, I think that's where you'd see it. Um, so there's nothing to prohibit them from doing that, but we have not right. done the okay. district-wide training. Thank you for clarifying that. How does the LEAD cohort fit into this picture? Because I know that they could provide yep. some expertise yep. and support in that area. Are they getting the necessary supports to, um, to participate in that work? Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that question. Um, I, they would be much better suited to answer that, quite frankly, but I sure hope they would um, feel like they are, are well supported. Um, I know part of the reason, as Laura mentioned, that there's sort of a delay between the adoption and the requirement is ODE's very specific understanding that um, barreling into these really rich and, um, and awesome standards without teachers um, understanding how to have difficult dialogue in the classroom and how to make sure we don't further traumatize students or um, shut people down is, um, is a key part of making those effective. And so the lead cohort, um, I, it certainly wasn't intended to do that work specifically as far as the social studies standards, but um, their focus is really helping us all understand what it looks like and sounds like to have that type of dialogue um, and, and help us try to scale that a little bit. So, um, so that definitely is a direct connection. As far as their own supports, we've actually been working with, um, well, last year a couple times, we worked with the ODE rep who um, oversees social sciences. He, he came and worked with us a few times on just the standards and context. Uh, um, so they've had some unique opportunities in that way. Um, and continuing to get training and PD opportunities from 
uh, different local, from community partners to um, you know, state and national level opportunities that um, very much apply to some of those standards. So I hope, um, I hope they become uh, uh, or continue to be, I guess, a resource for us in that way. But, um, yeah. Did that answer the question? Yes, Kinsey, okay. thank you. Awesome. I would just like to add that, quite frankly, Executive Limitation 8 constitutes the entirety of our instructional programming. And so we are glad to have opportunities to bring this back to you on a recurring fashion and we can, uh, we can talk about any and all of these interests as we would bring that back and I think go into grand detail in each of those areas. Trying to accomplish all of executive limitation to eight in one workshop is not advisable and we would love to have that opportunity to share it with you in a different day. Thank you. Maybe to move to nine. So we will now move into executive limitation number nine, which is on technology. And when we talk about the board goals that are the focus tonight, when we think about foundational skills and uh, students having a passion and a purpose and a plan, thinking about those, those are part of the reason that we made executive limitation nine part of tonight's uh, discussion. Obviously, if you've looked at it, there are other parts of that in terms of network security and some things that are very, very important to our district, but perhaps don't directly address that goal. Um, rather, in, in looking at the time, rather than um, planning a formal presentation tonight, what I asked is uh, Skip Offenhauser, who is our director of elementary, executive director of elementary programs, but also uh, has the IT expertise, uh, in, excuse me, instructional technology expertise in our our team, uh, and Scott McDonald, who is the Director of Information Technology, and Amy Tarno, who's the Administrator for Ben Lapine Schools Online. I asked each of them just to speak briefly to some of their highlights uh, uh, in, in their work over the last year. So good evening. Um, some of you know me as the director of elementary programming, but prior to that, I oversaw um, instructional technology. And um, tonight, uh, and I have that back on my plate, which is great, because I like, I like doing that. Um, and the only reason I can do that is because I have a wonderful director that works with me in, in uh, Tammy Doty. So um, uh, instructional technology, Melissa, I want to just comment on what you said earlier, where you said, um, you said something about the interconnectedness of, of education, and that is very true for this EL, because we have technology and we have instruction and, bl and blending them together. So, and sometimes it looks like they should be completely separate, but we work so hand in hand that um, having them together does make, does make sense. And I w we presented last spring, so it hasn't been too long since this EL has, has been brought up, so that's why we have this very low tech presentation where we're just going to highlight some of our some of our uh, um, uh, highlights or some of our uh, things that have, have changed um, I do want to just say that Ben Lapine in March 2020 I know we don't like to think about March 2020 because that's when we went into the pandemic but I, I just have to keep saying and reiterating that while nobody ever planned nobody ever thought that we would get into that situation and that would that would come about um, ben Lapine Schools was very well positioned and prepared to um, enter into distance learning um, and, uh, um, and remote remote learning. It was by the, uh, the work from some of our district leaders who were very innovative and um, were thinking ahead and because of the support that we had from our IT department and our wonderful coaches our teachers made the transition and our kids made the transition as well as they possibly could. In fact, better, better than most. Definitely not something we wanted to do, but we, we weathered the storm, I think, pretty well and, mo and better than most. Um, as we are coming out of that, out of the pandemic, um, I think we are learning, we've learned some lessons and we're bringing in some things to our classroom that we want to keep going. Um, some of the systems that we've put in place um, WebEx being one of them is allowing us to conduct our parent-teacher conferences uh, remotely. 
That is not what we would like to do, but is what we have to do right now. But, and so we're able to do that. Um, we have um, programs in place at the elementary level, I'll speak specifically, like Dreambox and Lexia, which are really um, helping us um, uh, implement blended learning within our classrooms. And blended learning is taking some of those, um, those systems and allowing us to work very, um, uh, um, in a very smart way. We're able to pull data out of those systems in, in reading and in math and target those students in the skills and the standards that they specifically need. So as we think about the learning loss and we think about coming out of the pandemic and, and addressing some of those um, academic challenges, it's systems like that and programs like that that are gonna help us along, along the way. Um, At the um, secondary level, for those of you who are living with um, middle school or, or um, high school students, you also have um, Canvas, which we were planning to implement before the pandemic hit, and we accelerated that quite, um, quite quickly. Um, we have teams that are working on that, and we have all of our teachers that at the secondary level that are using those systems to put the content there, when it, which I think has open the door to our parents being able to see what is actually going on in, in the classroom and be able to engage them much more than we were able to do before. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Amy and Scott and let them uh, cover some of their highlights and then we'll be open for any questions that you might have. Hello everyone. It's uh Wonderful to see you all face to face. Last time we did this, we were virtual and uh, I was just reflecting on that a little while ago, thinking about how different and wonderful this is. So thank you for having us tonight. Um, as I was listening to Skip talk, it occurred to me that this is my 10th year of involvement with the Ben Lapine Schools online program. And over that time, it's grown from being a fraction of what I did in our work with instructional technology to this year being the first time ever that it is my entire plate. And I think that is maybe somewhat in response to the pandemic, but I think it's also demonstrative of how our community is asking different things and different options from our schools. And we're lucky in Ben Lapine, much like we were with instructional technology, that we've had a long established online program and that we had that foundation going into the pandemic so that we could serve even more students last year than we've ever served before. So this year in our programming, our focus has really been on looking at what our, listening to our community, to our parents and to our students and trying to build a program based on what they're asking for and what they're needing. So prior to the pandemic, Ben Lapine Online was very, very much an independent program that families would opt into, and it was very much a homeschoolish almost type of scenario where parents were um, almost completely the support for their students. And what we've seen and heard is that families, we do have families that still want that very independent online option, but we also have families who found their students did really, really well and really enjoyed CDL last year. There were things about that that worked for them. Parents enjoyed being with their students and they liked having that connection and, and control over student learning. So as we've built our program this year, we've really focused on, um, in our full-time program, two options. Uh, one being our traditional Ben Lapine online option, which is our independent online option and the other being what we're calling our enhanced online option that is more like CDO. What we did with enhanced online is we tried to take the best pieces of what we did in Ben Lapine online last year, um, some choices for kids, some virtual clubs that really created active engagement. So we took those and we added in those, that face-to-face -face synchronous instruction and those connections with teachers. So we have both options discreetly, but we also like to tell our families then in Ben Lapine Online, they really get to build a program that works for their students. So if a family's in Enhanced Online, they might choose to do their classes in the morning, and they'll also have some opportunities to interact with their teacher in small groups. 
but the family might decide to opt out of our clubs in the afternoon because they have other things they're studying, working on, or doing as a family. But those enhanced students do have that synchronous instructional time. Our independent students, on the other hand, might say, you know what, we don't want to be tied to a class meeting every day. We choose not to do these whole group lessons, but you know what, my student's going to opt in and out of some of these other opportunities with these teachers. They're going to choose to do some read-alouds with them. They're going to opt into some virtual clubs and other pieces. So we like to say that independent isn't all independent if families choose to add more. And enhanced isn't all enhanced if families choose to take some pieces out. So let me see. Anything else I missed? Um, in terms of numbers, we currently have about 520 students in our full-time program, down from last year, up from where we were before the pandemic, but not up a terrible amount. Um, I think it's uh, Going forward from here, we're going to see families that, that still enjoy this, and I think that our numbers after the pandemic will be bigger than they were before. Um, we also serve students, so in addition to serving students full-time in Ben Lapine Online, something that people don't realize sometimes is we also serve students part-time. So at each of our high schools, we actually have an online lab. We call it uh, staffed by one of our Ben Lapine Online staff. We call them our online student success monitors or our awesomes. And our awesomes are awesome. They serve many, many kids both in their labs in their high schools and then supporting students who might be attached to that high school but taking a class outside the regular school day. So actually the majority of the students we serve are in that part-time nature, um, both at the high school level and then even at, at middle and elementary school where families choose to add options to their schedules for different reasons. Scott, you're up. Okay. I know a formal presentation did happen with the L9 last spring, but I think the humor's not lost that we're all working from paper from our pockets and <laughs> IT team. Uh, low tech. I'm Scott McDonald. I'm your uh, new information technology director. Uh, this is about my six month anniversary uh, of a dream, what's turning out to be my dream job. And I've worked for Ben Lapine for over 21 years and now with in, in instruction. And now I work with 30 of the most wonderful, hardworking people in the basement that you will ever meet. Um, 13 of those people are directly involved in our schools, serving our teachers and our families and our students in client services. <coughs> Uh, eight more uh, help us in uh, system support. Uh, they're the back end, the backbone of everything that our, our teachers do with students from curriculum to our student information system uh, to everything that happens to, with our student data. Uh, and the rest uh, do deal with uh, engineering, uh, building engineers, we have network engineers, we have folks doing GIS, we have uh, just an amazingly talented group of people that we're very lucky to have. As of last Monday, uh, it's the first time we've been fully staffed since I've been, been in the department. Uh, and every, uh, everyone in this room has met a lot of our new people. I've been courting them around a lot. And uh, we have, we've grabbed some amazing talent and, and really proud they, that they've joined Ben Lapine. Look forward to having them a lot of years. Um, highlighting some of what those groups are doing right now. Our client services team just completed a rollout of iPads for the first time during the school year at this fall because our kids kept iPads through the summer. That was a, a challenge. Uh, they came in using their iPads learning on day one and we had to take them from them and switch over uh, 4,600 of those uh, iPads from our over 17,500 students. So that was a lot. Um, our school partners were amazing. They were patient and, and they, they, it was uh, just one of those things that you got to see work and we're very proud to see it happen. Um, in our system support, these are the folks that are uh, sending out COVID notifications seven days a week. These are folks that are helping stand up uh, um, our equity-based grading programs and working with teachers and, and leadership to to uh, see what those kinds of changes are gonna bring and making sure we have systems to support that work. Uh, these are the folks that are, uh, um, well, they do a lot. And then what I wanna focus on 
just highlight a couple points of this from our engineering team. Because if we're not talking about COVID, we're probably talking about security, uh, data privacy, and cybersecurity. And right when I came on, uh, we, we, uh, with the support of Brad Henry, um, we've invested a lot in our infrastructure to address needs for cybersecurity in three different areas. I can't go into specifics because, well, it's security. Um, but recovery, we've addressed four different unique points and uh, uh, made improvements for our data recovery systems. Six different end user protections in education and three different uh, points for prevention and um, protection. I'll highlight a little bit on, on, on the second point, the end user protection in education. Last year we introduced uh, our wildly popular phishing testing software. Our teachers uh, have been uh, going through a class that was optional last year. We're hoping to make it mandatory this year uh, from our Know Before curriculum that explains just what kinds of things can happen and how vulnerable uh, having over 20,000 endpoints in our school system uh, can, can make our, our student data and our own, uh, our, our own data. So that education has been very helpful. And then we've done these phishing tests where teachers will get a fake, uh, hey, click on this and, and, you know, and if they get them, they get a warning saying, hey, gosh, you know, next time look for these kinds of uh, tips to make, make your school district more safe. And if they use our phishing tool and report it, they get this nice little, hey, you just made your school district a little safer. And that data has been going up each month. People Scott, are really figuring it out. It's Scott, not fun. just teachers, but also yeah. district leaders and superintendents <laughs> also get phishing alerts. Yeah, I'm not going to name names about who we've caught phishing. Um, I just want to hit a couple of points before I stop speaking about uh, your lens in equity. Um, it's really exciting to come from the instructional side and work with these professionals. The work, uh, um, just today I worked with Kenzie about addressing some of the naming challenges of our students who are going through uh, transgender issues and changing and what that does in our student information system and we're trying to be proactive and try and help some of our students with that. Um, of course, I've already mentioned the equity-based grading group that uh, we're partnering with and trying to be at the table early in these decisions to help make sure that we have the systems in place to support the ever-changing dynamic needs of our education, educators. And um, I lost where I put that in the notes. Oh, no, hotspots. Oh, my gosh, hotspots. We have over... Uh, just close to 1,100 hotspots, a carryover from COVID, of course, but now a service that really helps our, our, our families that are used to working from home. We never require connectivity in our, in our work from home, and, and by golly, I know we still discourage it, but, but now they've had that, and, and so our families that didn't have connectivity for their devices, their student devices, now have it. Um, and most importantly, we've built a system, a mobile device management system for these hotspots so that only our student iPads can connect to our hotspots. So they're not, um, they're not an entertainment. They're not hooking up to Netflix. They're not able to do anything except what they can get to from our student iPads. And we're really proud of how that targets the needs of our, of our most uh, 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 deserving students. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right, any questions, comments? I, I mean, I'll start and just say thank you so much. Um, I don't think that people always realize the lift um, that our tech department has done. And I think that what we heard tonight was really about responsive um, uh, development. Uh, based on not just this pandemic, but our, our families. And so just really wanna um, appreciate the work in terms of our instructional technology and feeling like, um, I hate this phrase, fail forward, but for lack of a better one, because um, I don't think we were failing, but, but, but we found things and we've been able to accelerate things in our instructional program because of this pandemic and said, here's some key learnings. 
um, that we can do in terms of how we meet families who are not comfortable um, or do not want to be um, in in-person instruction. We've, we've expanded our BLPO to have like um, robust options for, for kids and then just really looking at um, how all of these different technology pieces um, <laughs> from that security um, to, um, uh, to the hotspots to actually just having iPads in hands for kids and for families. Um, that was one of the pieces I think that really positioned us well. Um, and so just want to give a huge shout out to our IT team. And then I'm going to put um, Dr. Cook on um, the spot here because I remember at our barbecue, he mentioned that the IT team needed new paint and carpet downstairs. So I'm just curious whether you have that yet. Um, we, we did get everybody a shirt. Um, but we're still working on the paint. So as a matter of fact, Scott is modeling those shirts as we speak. So yes, we still have some work to do with the paint. Yes, thanks for that. I'll keep pushing. You guys deserve it. Uh, prior to the pandemic, because um, obviously our reliance on technology and having this infrastructure was so important at this time. But prior to the start of this, uh, we had a lot of families advocating for us to use less screen time and to really be targeted with how we use technology. Um, and so I'm wondering, as we're in person and needing to be less online, how are we working on not using technology as much in the classroom? given that, that was, the screen time was a huge concern of families and you know, one of our goals is engagement with families. You know, I know we talked kind of about maybe putting together an advisory panel, looking at the health impacts of screen time. What work are we doing on that right now? So that, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's something that we keep in mind whenever we're bringing something on board. Um, for example, Dreambox and, and Lexia. Um, there's some, there's, they are a good thing, but too much of a good thing is not, is not good. So we're, we're trying to, you know, find that sweet spot in, um, in the delivery of those systems where um, we recommend uh, a very, very limited time in the classroom for using that because it's very purposeful and it gives us good information. Um, but we don't want kids sitting there on Lexia or Dreambox for a half hour, 45 minutes at a time. That's not what we, what we want, want happening. So, um, so we're, Constantly delivering delivering that message um, to our to our teachers um, to our families, and we don't want them going home and using using Lexi or Dreambox for an hour, two hours at a time at a time either. Um, as far as the um, uh, digital review, that is something that is still on our radar that we want to have um, put together and continue the work. I think with some of the things that we have been having to do around technology. It's, um, I don't want to been a, kind of put on the back burner just a little bit, but um, as we're making decisions, I, I can turn to, uh, um, well, I can turn to Amy and, and to Scott, and in our meeting this week, I was even saying, well, as we move forward, I think we have to remember what the, if we were to have a digital review committee, what would they would be bringing up? So we're making sure that we're thinking ahead and not and when we're making those decisions as if, there was a review, review, review committee already in place. But that is something, just like a, um, um, a curriculum review, that we need to do, and we should be doing it on a regular cycle, approximately every five or six years, just to review our practices, review our technology that we're using, and make sure that we are um, staying up to date on, on what we need. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that, Amy, because it is in the executive limitation uh, doing a, a periodic curriculum review the way we do a sites and facilities review. Um, I will be honest that we do not have the bandwidth this fall to do it. Uh, one, one of the things I'm thinking about for next year is we have, we were in discussion about a, a larger look at our curriculum and instruction and, and, and trying to fold that process in at least for a, you know, a starting point next year. We had we had the grand plans and discussed those the fall of 2019, and then um, 
anyway, no excuses, but uh, it certainly wasn't the time to ask people about whether they were using too much technology. <laughs> um, but um, I do think it's important that we, and, and again, that is, a, that is a, one of those guardrails that the board has for us. So I think um, maybe in a launch next year, folding it in with a larger process. Thank you. I have Marcus and then Carrie. Thank you for the information, I appreciate it. Uh, the one thing I want to ask about is, are we going to do any assessment with these online students in terms of state testing, those type things? Are we have to prepare for that? That's the first thing. The second thing is, what kind of data do we have in terms of the uh, marginalized underserved, in terms of making sure they get access to information and so forth and so on? And then the other piece is, what information do you have in terms of how students did online versus traditional students? You know, are they performing a little bit better or, you know, what's going on? Are you hearing anything from parents or teachers saying that some students did better who were challenged in, you know, before they went online and now they're doing a little bit better? So do you have any information on that? Um, not a lot. But uh, so up to this year, um, something, it's always been a challenge for us to disaggregate the data from our online students from those in our brick and mortar schools because our online students have always been cross enrolled back to their brick and mortar school. So unless we're, I mean, my team keeps paper records to an extent and spreadsheets, monitoring their students and looking at it so that we can tell how our students are doing. So, sorry, you had multiple points to your question. I was trying to track them all in my head as you were going, Marcus. So assessment, um, we are currently and, and almost finished uh, doing Dibbles assessments with all of our online students. So Julie and Lindsley and that team have helped us with um, bringing our team up to speed. But as you can imagine, um, we have online students. And our online students don't necessarily want to come in to do a Dibbles test. So we've offered in-person Dibbles testing in Bend. We've offered it in Lapine. And then we trained our entire staff, including our high school teachers. Um, and they have been, I've got to say, one of the best things I've listened to all year was Brad Soto, who was our district teacher of the year, dibbles testing a first grader last week um, outside of, of my office. And he had a tie on, and he was just, he was darling, and he did an amazing job with this student. So we're working hard to get as much data as we can on our students so we can target interventions to them. Online students take state assessments and other assessments just like our brick and mortar students. Once again, our challenge is getting them in. We can't do state assessments at home so they need to come to a school site. So we try to offer throughout the spring times when they can come in and be really flexible to meet the needs as many, of as many families as possible. So assessment was one part. Um, data on our marginalized and underserved students. Uh, Something I like to say about our program is that we really have to look at our students first and understand them and know their story and figure out what's going to work for them based on who they are and what they bring to us rather than bringing them in and trying to fit them into the way that, we, that, the way that things are done by adults. So right now we're in the process with a lot of our students also of, um, for example, our, our students in special programs uh, looking at reviewing and, and reviewing their IEPs and their goals to make sure that, that, that those can be met and served in the online environment, which frequently requires those goals to be um, rewritten in a way that, that those services can be provided. Um, hotspots from IT have been an important part of the work we do of getting students access to instructional materials through the online world. And then I'm really excited this year that we have an, an ELD specialist um, from Kinsey's team that is located with our staff and interacting daily with us and really looking at ways to target our students, our, our English language learners, um, and figure out how to best serve them when they're in the online environment. Um, our, our biggest challenge is engagement. You know, something that, that you've got to think about with online and, and I've been saying this a lot lately, but it, it's just something we've, we've got to think about in online is that when in a brick and mortar school, students can be passively engaged and they can still get something. 
Even if a student doesn't necessarily want to be in class or they're having a bad day, they can be sitting in the classroom and their teachers are going to be giving them things and their teachers are going to be taking things back. In online, if our kids aren't actively engaged, then they're not getting anything. So we have incredible teachers who are doing all they can to rope their, their, their students in and to get them to engage with them so then we can deliver the services that students need. Marcus, I would also add that um, that addition of those of those teachers, I think, is is, is super super critical. We also, um, when we had Ben Lapine online as more of the independent, um, it was only available to you if you had an internet connection and you had a device at home. And so we have eliminated that, where we now have the hotspot if you need a hotspot, and we have <coughs> provided all of our Ben Lapine online students with the same technology that our brick and mortar students get, and that wasn't true two years ago, and we have made, made, that, made that switch. So if a student wants to um, pursue that option, either full-time or just part-time, I wanna take one class, they, they can do that. Um, and those teachers are also in the, in the process, our, our grand plan moving forward is, is making more and more classes in campus that are homegrown classes that are very much aligned with our brick and mortar classes and they're not from our vendor fuel ed and um, we have a lot more control over how we can tailor those to different, to different kids and different needs. Carrie? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for that report. As others have said, a ton to celebrate and a lot that we don't think about that goes on behind the scenes to make everything work. So thank you. Um, I wanna build on Amy's comments a little bit and really push today on sections two and three of our exec executive limitation number nine um, and uh, push a little bit on your response um, that I know we I know we don't have the capacity, but I'm concerned um, about the sense of a little bit of lack of urgency around looking at instructional technology in our classrooms for two reasons. One is because our kids just went through a period of life where they spent hours and hours and hours a day on screens, um, both at school and at home due to the pandemic. And I think there's a real concern about um, the long-term implications of that. And because, um, we started our meeting hearing about some really concerning proficiency levels um, of our students and we have very limited time with them each day and so it's critical that every minute that we spend has the highest efficacy possible. Um, so I'm just going to list a bunch of questions that I have um, in sections two and three. I will also email these to you. I do not expect you to answer them today. Um, but I really would love for our next report on here to become more data driven around mm -hmm. instructional technology in classrooms. Carrie, um, before yeah. you go to, into the questions, I'm not yeah. clear, maybe others are, on what you mean by sections two and three. Sorry, um, I mean, um, when I'm looking at the executive limitation Somewhere and too. under the superintendent will not fail to, there's like one, provide a total access to hardware. Okay to establish and support adherence to common expectations. So I was particularly looking at two and three. Thank you. Thank you for that, yeah. So um, I really wanna understand how much time students are spending on their devices each day or week in school. And I know a few years ago when we asked, we didn't know the answer to that question. I'd like to know if we've made any progress on that and if not, how we can moving forward. Um, and specifically how that time is split between learning apps, which essentially replaces a teacher versus using a device to do research or write a paper where we're just replacing paper with a computer. Um, and understanding how much does that usage differ across classes and schools. For example, I have a friend um, who has two children who are one grade level apart in early elementary school in Bend, and one child's iPad shows almost two hours of use a day, and another child's iPad shows about 30 minutes of use a day. So I'm curious if we're okay with that level of disparity across different classes and schools, and if we're trying to study what the best level of usage is, um, how our district's usage compares to best practices and research, what research and data collection we're doing in Ben Lapine to improve our use of educational technology. Um, I'm wondering if students who are in remediation or acceleration spend more or less time on devices than students who are at grade level and how that's decided and how efficacy is measured. 
Um, I'd love to know how students, parents, and teachers feel about our district's use of technology. Um, I'd like to better understand how we validate the supposed learning that's happening on devices according to their own assessments with our own independent assessments um, and understand if outcomes from assessments and apps and software match outcomes measured um, by our own assessments. Um, and then try to understand the research on how more time on screens potentially contributes to behavior problems in schools. I know anecdotally, myself and most parents I know see a correlation between time spent on screens at home and worsening behavior outcomes. Um, and ultimately, I'm sure you have even better questions to ask than I do, so I really wanna hear what questions you think we should be looking at more closely with regards to instructional technology. But again, I think our time um, is so precious in our classrooms. Um, I'd really just like to better understand the ROI and efficacy and pros and cons and potential unintended consequences um, of time spent on screens in school. Thank you. And so Carrie, before Skip jumps in. <laughs> I wasn't gonna, no, she okay. said I didn't have to answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and so I think, I think similar to the questions around our social studies curriculum earlier tonight, these are things that will come up cyclically. And so I feel like with the social studies questions, that's a future, a future meeting where around EL8, we're able to dive in and bring more information on that. And these questions I think are great um, in terms of that digital review process that people have raised. And, um, and so bringing those, bringing those back up, if that sounds right to you, um, Skip. I think those. I think those questions. If we, Carrie, if you could, you know, make sure you um, you have those written down and send them. Those are good questions and good starting points for our digital review to consider as we start forming that and and you know, plotting the course, the direction we want to take. Great. Then, if that's okay, that's where we're gonna go. Are there other pieces um, that board members have for our team on EL nine? I just want to, um, maybe this feels like pushing back a little bit, but this stood out to me particularly when we're talking about providing the technology necessary for the student to succeed at home. In my experience with Ben Lapine Online, it was seamless. It was a great transition. My student, my, my son at home was very much supported and it was all in all a great experience that he did for eighth. However, knowing that those barriers existed prior to the pandemic for a lot of families that don't have that access to technology, particularly around the hotspots when, when, when it was mentioned that, you know, that monitored use or, or essentially cutting it off, you know, that, that's concerning to me and, and here's just one reason why. In, in my experience with the early learning hub and better together, some of the work that we did was to distribute hotspots, distribute Chromebooks, and essentially give that autonomy to the family to best determine how to use that and how, how, how often they were going to be on screen and what, what they were going to be accessing. In limiting or restricting their access, um, we saw less engagement, and, and we're talking about family engagement, we saw less engagement from that because families felt obligated to only use it for its intended purpose, which makes sense. But at the same time, those families that were greatly benefiting from having a hotspot and having technology at home that prior to the pandemic did not have, their, their, fam their engagement with family councils and some of that work that we're doing increased hugely. Mm -hmm. And so now we had parents who were not only wanting to be more involved in, in those processes of you know, the early literacy programs, but also wanted further engagement with a lot of the other programs that we were running. And then they would tell their friend, hey, they're giving away a hotspot and a Chromebook, you have to sign up for this program. And so we had you know, this influx of students and, and families that essentially said, you know, I wanna have access to the same things that, that others have. And so again, my, my concern is, is, I understand the need for that kind of monitor use, but at the same time, how much are we restricting those families that have not had access to this that now can use it for job searching, for you know, filling out, um, rental applications online, accessing DHS programs. I mean, the list goes on and on. Just very briefly, um, our hotspot program is kind of the simplest form of this connectivity um, help for families. Uh, I'm working with our partner right now, which is T-Mobile, um, conversation just last week. Uh, I don't know what this acronym stands for, but EBB, 
and it's a program where our families can qualify for free internet, uh, if, and this is an ongoing program, and, and we're working to partner, uh, be a, a, maybe a communicator, a helper of our families to get that kind of connectivity uh, sh for, for their families should they need it. Um, our hotspots, a simple path that can be checked out in the library to a student, really a direct connection serving, you know, we can pivot if, if a school gets quarantined um, uh, in a larger scale, think about how quickly we can get our families connected. That's what this program's for. To help our families more directly, we'll certainly partner with other folks and organizations and, and, and be their communicators to make sure they get the services they need. Yeah, and I think with our hotspots, one of the things that we, we have to balance out is, you know, we, we, we pay for those. We have a, a contract with them, and in looking at their usage, um, we realize that you know we our, our main goal is to make sure that they're used for educational purposes. But with any of our um, our iPads, family members can use those iPads. So parents can jump on those iPads and go to websites within our filtering. So that's something to keep in mind: is those hotspots and those iPads go through our whole filtering system, which we have an obligation to do. Um, but um, as far as getting on and you know. Uh, uh, filling out this application or going to this website to get this information, for the most part, I would say that they would be able to do that. To jump on and watch Netflix, no. <laughs> so. Are there other questions? I think, I mean, I think that that question as well continues to be something to be looking at in terms of our digital review process. And I don't wanna say that this is the same as um, all of the conversations that, um, that Steve mentioned earlier around reading, but there are very differing viewpoints on technology and technology use, use in our community. And so I think that being able to navigate those and really look at those and look at the research um, along with all of these different questions and then really root back into our intent um, during that digital review process will really support our district. Thank you. Um, I also just really want to, I, again, thank our instructional team. I, one of the pieces, even though this wasn't an interactive work session, one of the things that our, our board of directors has really asked is can we look at what our goals are, can we look at the data, and then can we hear about the actions that, that we're taking um, to move the needle on those pieces? And I think that tonight really exemplified um, that ask. Um, and so just really want to thank our, our cabinet and our team um, for that. With that, we will now open the floor for board comment. Again, board comment is not required, um, but is optional. So I will take board comment at this time. Go Braves. Just, just an extra thanks to our teachers this week. I truly am thankful for teachers every day, but as I sent my child off to school in a costume today, um, I was reminded back to when I was a teacher and Halloween week um, and all the extra uh, excitement and energy that comes with that. So a uh, special appreciation to our teachers this week, really excited for conferences um, and to experience them as a parent and grateful for all the work that goes into this. Yeah, and I'll build on what Carrie says. Uh, I, on Friday, uh, did a school visit to Juniper Elementary, and it was so great to be back in a school and to see all of the students and to talk with the principal and to see the learning taking place. Um, and it really you know, reminds me that this is why we do what we do. Um, and I'm so thankful that our students are back in buildings and you know, I know a lot of parents are not happy about conferences being online, for example. Um, and I realize as a board member, it, I have the privilege of being able to go into schools at this time. And a lot of our parents don't. Um, and I really hope as our case numbers go down into Chutes County, we can work on getting our parents back into buildings as volunteers. Um, I think that is so important for every student to have the opportunity to see their parents coming into the buildings. Um, 
but I also have to say as a working parent, I'm very thankful that technology allows us to have uh, conferences online because the conference times we were assigned, I was like, oh yeah, 10 o'clock, I work in Redmond. I can't drive to school at 10 o'clock and then go back. But I can take a 20 minute break and log in, to my, log in and have that conference. Um, so that's one of the blessings of technology as well. So I'm so thankful for all of the work that our teachers and every educator in our district is doing right now. I want to very quickly say in the last two weeks, a couple of highlights um, in my outside of the board meetings. Um, one uh, was being able to meet alongside Marcus um, with restorative justice and equity um, group and just being able to continue to talk about the ways that they're um, able to support our district um, and advance some of the work that we're doing. Um, second, my goodness, Caldera High School, what a joyous, joyous, Ex, uh, experience and again alongside Marcus we spent two and a half hours um, giving the children um, a, and adults of this community a lot of sugar um, <laughs> with cookies um, and so just a huge shout out to everybody um, from Mike Tiller in our facilities to um, just our entire team and then Chris Boyd for his vision um, for that high school it just uh, what a joyous occasion and then last, I did want to give a quick shout out. We heard earlier, but Brad Soto was named our Teacher of the Year um, for Ben Lapine. And then something that we didn't really mention um, is that Steve Weatherald um, also is our regional, was named the Regional Teacher of the Year um, in May. And so just want to give uh, that shout out to two of our local educators. Melissa, sorry, I forgot one um, shout out uh, that I just wanted to give real quick. I've been involved in a number of conversations about our child care crisis over the last um, couple of months. And the Boys and Girls Club and St. Charles and OSU Cascades re recently partnered um, to apply for uh, some money from the county and it was approved over $2 million um, that will go a long way towards helping to plan um, and execute on more child care in our community. So lots and lots of conversations going on behind the scenes, um, but that was one huge win for our community. So I just wanted to celebrate everyone that was involved with that. Thank you. And with that, if there's no other comment, I will call our meeting, I will recess, bring our meeting to a close. Thank you. Thank you.